This episode is brought to you by Audible. This is Central Park. It's scenic, it's massive, and it's full of dogs. It's a green rectangle in the middle of Manhattan that's been there since 1876, back when New York used to look more like this. Going all the way from 59th Street on the south end to 110th at the northernmost point, the park covers over 800 acres, 1.3 square miles, and each and every year, around 42 million people come to see it. The park has 36 bridges, 10,000 benches, and you get the point. Central Park is very big and it's full of stuff. With so much ground to cover, so many people coming in and out, and in a city that produces 12,000 tons of trash every single day, who takes care of all this? Who cleans the park? On the Central Park Wikipedia page, the answer is the Central Park Conservancy, a private nonprofit hired by the city's government and parks department. They clean the park. And indeed, if you're ever walking through it, the CPC's logo is on just about every sign between 59th and 110th. But it turns out the answer is not that simple. Behind the scenes, when digging through the details of the park's management, the real answer is much more complex and incredibly revealing. There's a lot more to who cleans Central Park. Hidden away from public eyes, there exists an entire network of state and private abuses of power. The kind that reveal the crisis of neoliberal management, and maybe even the seeds of the death of work. To understand what's really going on, we need to go back around 50 years to the 1970s New York fiscal crisis. Back in the mid-70s, New York was on the brink of bankruptcy. Decline in manufacturing, demographic flight to the city's suburbs, and expanded social policy meant that the city was running out of money. Budgets suddenly got a lot tighter, and the city was flirting with defaulting on its loans. Loans it had only taken out on the assumption that national policies would eventually replace the city's own social programs like Medicaid. The city borrowed, but only as a temporary measure until the rest of the country caught up. National Medicaid is on its way, city officials would say. But the U.S. couldn't get there fast enough, and by 1975, the whole country fell into a recession, and those loans that the city had taken out started becoming a problem. Banks suddenly got very concerned when it came to loaning more to the city. After all, unlike national governments, cities can run out of money. If everything went down and the recession kept going, lenders couldn't be sure they'd get a cut of the scraps. So by that year's spring, the banks cut New York off entirely. New York was in trouble. Abraham Beam and Hugh Carey, the city mayor and state governor, rushed to the White House to meet with Gerald Ford, begging the sitting president to supply the city with cash, warning him of the risk of total societal breakdown and the collapse of civil peace should the local government go bankrupt. After all, protests and demonstrations by union labor, public workers, and the city's residents seemed to warrant these fears in the political class's eyes. But Ford didn't love the idea of giving New York money? So, faced with mounting pressure and walls coming in from all sides, the city chose budget cuts. The 70s had pushed New Yorkers into austerity, and the city into the hands of a conservative and corporate takeover. Neoliberalism was born. Amidst all this pressure to find money somewhere in the budget, the city ran a competition. New York was desperate for savings of any kind, and wanted to find out whether it was more affordable to run the city's 1700 parks itself, or to contract it out to the private sector. Usually, when cities run these kinds of contests, not only does it mean they're desperate, but that they're looking for an excuse to take something out of their own hands. Leaner, meaner, quicker, private corporations often boast that they can do what the public sector does, but both cheaper and more efficiently. But not this time. This time, the city won. And for one special reason. We have something corporations don't have, free labor. That's Maude Simonet, one of the authors of the book Who Cleans the Parks, retelling a conversation she had with a high-ranking official in New York. The we that's being referred to here is the city government, the contest winners. The city won against all odds because, unlike the private sector, the city had what every employer can only dream of, unpaid workers. Let's fast forward to the present day. Today, Central Park isn't really cleaned by the Central Park Conservancy. Rather, the cleaning of the park is doled out to a small army of different kinds of workers. Various conservancies, like the CPC, coordinate a good chunk of these workers. But that's just one part of the picture. The CPC is just one actor among many, despite getting all the credit. 
In reality, park cleaning responsibilities all around the city are split between conservancies like the CPC and volunteers, unionized workers employed by the city, summer youth workers, private contractors, people sentenced to community service, and most importantly, people who Simone and her co-writer John Krinsky call welfare-to-work trainees. New York City Park's saving grace is the unemployed. Let me explain. Between the 70s and today, New York's number of public employees tasked with taking care of the parks dropped from over 7,000 to fewer than 2,000. The parks didn't suddenly become easy to clean, but they stopped showing up in city budgets. Typically, when this is the case, it's because private industry took over. This is called privatization, and it's when a public service stops being administered by the public and gets handed over to a company by the government. Proponents of free market capitalism describe this approach as dismantling the state step by step turning over control and therefore power to market actors and the very specific set of incentives that they respond to. The kinds that, in theory, make prices go down and make administration more efficient. The inner workings of this administration get pulled behind closed doors. Decisions get made not by elected officials or bureaucrats accountable to the public, but by a group of investors. In short, companies do what companies do. They seek out profit and they use every tool at their disposal to achieve it. As an example, this is precisely what the English government did with their water infrastructure back in 1989. Water distribution in all of England, overnight, was privatized and turned over to the hands of privately owned companies. The result? A 40% increase in cost. That's 40% above inflation between 1989 and 2015. So, okay, privatization doesn't quite make water cheaper. But for these extra costs, you'd at least expect a better service, the kind of service that the private sector is always boasting about. Efficient, premium, and so on. Too bad. Three billion liters of water leak from England's privatized pipes each and every day, a number on the rise from the previous reported year. And that represents one-fifth of the national daily supply. Every day, 20% of the water in England gets wasted. Is there an upside to this shoddy service and higher costs? Yes, actually. Between 2007 and 2016, water providers made 18 billion pounds in profits, 95% of which went directly to shareholders. These same providers have a long track record of tax evasion, and its top executives walk away with multi-million dollar incomes every year. But that's not all. The whole operation rests on the promise that if something ever goes wrong with these industries that are so necessary to public life, the state is there to back private enterprises up and save them from collapse. Profits are privatized, losses are collectivized. The public interest gives way to the private. But that's not what New York did, at least not completely. Somehow, what the city did was worse. New York mobilized its workforce not on a discourse of capitalist efficiency or through a private market for employment, but on a discourse of civility and through welfare reforms. To get New York parks cleaned for free, all the city had to do was, let's say, tweak welfare requirements. Here's what they told welfare recipients. Clean the parks, or your welfare is gone. This was part of a greater shift in policy in the 1990s happening all across the US under the Clinton admin and its Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Act, what Bill called the end of welfare as we know it. Workfare, as it came to be known, replaced good old welfare. Being unemployed was no longer seen as an economic failure, the market malfunctioning and doing a bad job of allocating labor, but a personal failure. The new era declared that, no matter what, it is always your fault if you are unemployed. Markets don't make mistakes, and certainly aren't designed for this very thing to happen. No, of course not. So to make up for your mistake, you're going to have to work. Welfare changed dramatically, both in form and function. Instead of welfare being seen as a temporary assistance while people looked for a new job, an admission that there aren't always enough jobs to go around, welfare became something new. The idea behind workfare is that a person who is unemployed must be swimming in free time, and should therefore spend that time working to secure their rights, working to prove that they're a part of this society. Because if they aren't willing to prove that, why should society help them? You have to prove to the state that you're a good citizen, and good citizens work, even if it's under duress and for less money than the minimum wage. Not only does workfare not work, sources in the description, the new kind of employment it created isn't quite the same as other jobs in a capitalist economy. It's worse. 
It's paid less, to start off with, because of the idea that welfare can't be more than the minimum wage. But that's not all. Even more so than regular workers, workfare laborers are not well protected. If they get into an argument with their manager because they get pushed too far or are demanded to do work that is unsafe or unreasonably unpleasant, they can suddenly lose access to benefits for weeks on end. Weeks without food stamps, Medicare and housing vouchers, utility vouchers, cash assistance, and so on. A disagreement on the job can start to look like a death sentence when your job is a condition for everything you need to live a basic existence. And so, workfare workers are maximally exploitable. The state will happily cut you off. But the violence of this arrangement can't be presented so explicitly. So, for around 30 hours a week, workfare recipients are assigned to do menial tasks that they are told benefit the community and reaffirm their role as citizens. The whole thing is cleaned up nicely to seem almost benevolent. It's all about giving back. Securing your right to welfare is only incidental. This same discourse of community is then recycled and used to mobilize another group, volunteers. People who work without being coerced just because they think it's right. But what community is being invoked here? Is everyone really part of the same society this kind of work is supposedly benefiting? No, because beyond saving money for the city, exploiting welfare laborers makes money. When welfare recipients and volunteers make public spaces like Central Park better, cleaner, and prettier, the properties in the immediate vicinity start to appreciate in value. Think about it. If, from one day to the next, the park starts looking like a nice place to live next to, people will notice and property values around the park will go up. Back in 2007, real estate around Central Park was worth, in aggregate, more than half the value of all Manhattan real estate. Conservancies know this and even include it in their mission statements. Like the Bryant Park Corporation saying its work, quote, enhances the real estate values of its neighbors by continuously improving the park. It shouldn't be a surprise to anyone, however, that if you're on welfare, you probably aren't going to be benefiting from this price jump. For one thing, you probably don't live near a park, and certainly not near Central Park. But even if you did, there's almost no chance that you own the property in which you live. You probably rent. By increasing the value of the park, then, you are contributing to your own bills getting bigger every month. Your rent goes up because property values go up too. And you don't have a choice. You can't afford to be off welfare, so you work cleaning up the park. But that just makes living near the park even more unaffordable, so welfare is all the more necessary. Regardless of where you live, workfare of this kind takes your hard work and puts money in someone else's pocket. The private property owners. Meanwhile, you don't even have a job. You're doing this because it's just what a good citizen does, and the minute you stop, you aren't a citizen anymore in the eyes of the state. Asking who cleans the parks does a lot more than give you a straight answer. Not only does this question reveal one of the most insidious ways that the neoliberal state exploits its most vulnerable citizens and actively profits off that exploitation, but in the process, understanding who cleans the park also means understanding what our society considers work. Cleaning the parks is no longer a job, not really. The city's payrolls demonstrate as much, and the bulk of the work now gets done for free, either under duress or completely voluntarily. But it is nonetheless necessary labor. Life would deteriorate at an incredible pace if this kind of public labor wasn't being done. And yet it doesn't qualify as work. Because work needs to be paid for. Asking who cleans up the park therefore pulls us deep into the sociology of work and its invisibilization. How some labor is made invisible and considered outside the realm of work. In feminist studies, the classic example is domestic work, child rearing, cleaning the home, and so on, which isn't recognized as work because it isn't paid, and therefore becomes easy to cast aside and put down. For some reason, it's considered entirely different from work that gets done outside the home. To make up for the lack of compensation for this work, then, this labor gets imbued with a sense of value that is meant to hide the exploitation going on under the surface. Women, in particular, are told that being a mother is just so rewarding. It's raising the next generation. It's absolutely necessary labor for our great nation, but don't you dare ask to be paid for it. After all, it's the best job in the world. Cleaning the parks falls into a similar trap. It's not real work, silly. It's an act of community service. It's doing good for the world and being a good role model. Why should you get paid for something so enriching and valuable when you're being such a good person? Free labor is all around us. Stay-at-home parents, volunteers, unpaid interns. Maybe free labor even happens when you're at home building your IKEA furniture yourself. It's not just that all this work isn't being compensated, it's not being considered work at all. 
And yet without it, society would come to a grinding halt. We work tirelessly and we do it for free. You clean the parks. The broader topic we've explored here, the perversion of work and the dystopian reality of labor under capitalism, is incredibly complex and has its roots in the birth of neoliberalism. If you'd like to get a better understanding of just how disastrous that ideology has been for humanity, I highly recommend you check out A Brief History of Neoliberalism on Audible. I try my best to learn and understand as much as I can so I can share with others. And one way I like to do that is by listening to audiobooks. I travel a lot for work, so I have plenty of time to sit on planes and listen to fascinating audiobooks on Audible. David Harvey's Brief History of Neoliberalism was particularly interesting to me because it's a crash course in arguably the most damaging economic philosophy in history, told from an explicitly Marxist perspective. If you like to learn as much as I do, getting to pick a free audiobook every month is pretty nice. I don't think I can accurately convey how much I love Audible. I struggle to sit down and read a book. But with Audible, I can get through all the titles I've wanted to, all while running errands, or commuting, or traveling for work. It's completely changed how I learn. If you enjoyed this week's video, I highly, highly recommend you check out A Brief History of Neoliberalism on Audible. It's a fantastic listen. So, if you want to help support my channel so I can produce more content like this, visit audible.com slash secondthought, or text secondthought, one word, to 500-500. Sign up today and get your first month absolutely free. It really does help support me and my channel. Get started by following the link below, or by texting Second Thought to 500-500. That's all for today, I hope you found this topic as interesting as I did. It's one of many seemingly innocent things that hides yet another dirty truth of capitalism. If you like this sort of case study style of video, let me know in the comments. I want to try to make this content as interesting as possible, so I'm always open to suggestions. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week.